It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce the Honourable Geoffrey Ma, Chief Justice of Hong Kong, to deliver the 2018 Supreme Court of Queensland oration and to make some very brief opening remarks. I welcome all of you to the Banco Court tonight. Um, our Hong Kong friends, who include Chief Justice Ma's wife, Justice of Appeal Maria Yuen. We in Queensland know a little bit about this business of judges being married to each other. <laughs> um, and Chief Judge Andrew Chung, who is soon to become a judge of the High Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. Chief Justice Kiefel and Justices Keane and Edelman of our own High Court. Judges of the Supreme and District Courts, judges of the Federal Court, magistrates, retired judges, distinguished academics, members of the profession, ladies and gentlemen. And we are not alone. The oration is being streamed to Townsville, Rockhampton, Cairns and Mackay. So I welcome those attending there too. Chief Justice Ma is a native of Hong Kong, but he is in every sense a man of the world. He was educated in England his practice as a barrister was multinational. He was a member of the English Bar, the Hong Kong Bar, the Bar of the State of Victoria, and the Bar of Singapore. He's a patron of the London-based Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, and he is a supporter of Manchester United. And this is particularly appealing, he's an officer of the French Legion of Honour for his contribution to the promotion of French culture in Hong Kong. Chief Justice Ma's formidable career on the bench began when he was appointed a recorder of the Court of First Instance of the Hong Kong High Court in 2000, with various further appointments culminating in his becoming Chief Justice of the Court of Final Appeal in 2010. His Honours oration, as you know, concerns criticism of the courts and judges. I heard the Chief Justice speak on this topic as part of a panel at the Law Asia Conference last year. What he said resonated with me and I think with every judicial officer present. This is an issue across almost all jurisdictions. And it's a topic which should be of concern to everyone with an interest in our justice system and indeed democracy. I often quote a comment made by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the US Supreme Court. The reason why judicial independence is so important is because there has to be a place where being right is more important than being popular and where fairness trumps strength. That place is the courtroom. But that necessary independence is constantly assailed we live in a time when the President of the United States thinks it appropriate to criticise judges and judgments via tweet with as many hashtags as can be crammed into a 140 character limit. We've seen attacks by federal ministers on our own judges, unjustifiably accusing them, in effect, of acting on ideology and not legal principle. The media regularly express outrage, particularly over bail and sentencing decisions while commonly omitting salient details. I sometimes find myself drawn to the words of a Nobel laureate, Bob Dylan, don't criticise what you can't understand. But it is more complex than that. There's a balance to be struck between competing imperatives. On the one hand, the independence of the judiciary and public confidence in it, and on the other, freedom of communication and accountability. It's a great honour and a benefit for all of us to have Chief Justice Ma speak to us on these matters. So please join with me in welcoming his honour. Thank you, Chief Justice. Chief Justice of the High Court, Chief Justice of Queensland, uh, Justice Martin, judges of the Queensland Judiciary, uh, fellow judges, I'm trying to get this right actually, fellow lawyers, ladies and gentlemen. Singularly grand honour to be asked to deliver this year's uh, Supreme Court oration. 
When Justice Glenn Martin extended the invitation to me last February, uh, I was overwhelmed, had no hesitation in accepting. This oration has had many distinguished jurists it's, uh, precede me. It's an in intimidating thought. The Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia delivered the oration last year, and she will, in a few days' time, deliver here in the Banco Court the Australasian Institute of Judicial Administration oration. I am, however, much comforted uh, by the thought that I am among friends, many of you old friends, and that I've also had the pleasure of speaking here before, six years ago. The topic of criticism of the courts and of judges is not a new one. People have been making criticisms for a very long time. In his stimulating book, Judges, uh, in the chapter headed Criticism, uh, David Panic, uh, Lord Panic, refers to the case of Sergeant Rue, who in 1527 composed a satire performed in Gray's Inn on the abuses of the law for which Cardinal Wolsey, then the Lord Chancellor, was said to be responsible. He was summarily imprisoned after the play was finished. The relevant context at that time, the early 16th century, was many thought that judges were amenable to undue influence. The fact that Sir Thomas More was praised for not accepting gifts implicitly suggested that other judges were perhaps not quite so unblemished. Criticism of judges, specifically of court decisions, continues to this day. You will all no doubt be familiar with the reaction of one of the popular newspapers in the United Kingdom in 1987 following the spy catcher litigation in the United Kingdom when the House of Lords upheld an injunction preventing the publication of the memoirs of a former MI5 agent when they had already been published in other countries. Upside down photos of the law lords under the banner headline, You Fools, appeared in the newspaper. More recently, again in the United Kingdom, after the decision of the English Divisional Court uh, in the Miller case, this is uh, Miller against Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, uh, after that decision, there were startling headlines directed against the judges of the Divisional Court. Now, you'll know some of them because the Daily Mail published uh, under the headline, Enemies of the People, Lord Judge, who gave uh, uh, the oration here a few years ago, uh, described all this as being very unpleasant. There are other headlines. The Daily Telegraph, for example, had the Judges versus the People, the Sun newspaper uh, in, in the United Kingdom, Who Do You Think You Are? As only the Sun could do it, U was spelled E-U. This was a case not only of immense constitutional importance in the United Kingdom, it also had political consequences of which many people held extremely divergent views. Whichever way the case was decided, the outcome in the courts was always going to be controversial between the so-called Brexiteers and those who wished the United Kingdom to remain in the EU. Hong Kong has not been immune either. In recent times, I have been personally attacked as well. I've been called evil, incompetent, a person who deserves no respect, and a person dressed in a silly bib. <laughs> not, not tonight. I mean. <laughs> the criticism of courts and judges raises some fundamental dilemmas that are not easy to resolve. And it is some of these dilemmas I want to explore. They are easier to identify than to resolve. The difficulty lies in the fact that reasonable points of view do often proceed from diametrically opposite positions and finding some middle ground, if there is any, is often extremely hard. On the one hand, there is an imperative to uphold and maintain the dignity of the law and the necessary respect for it. This is symbolized in most statues of justice we see in almost every court around the world. The statue of Themis, with her right hand holding a sword as a sign of the authority of the law, stands outside these very courts. She stands atop the Court of Final Appeal building in Hong Kong. The sword is on her left hand. It's a, I think, northern, southern hemisphere thing, probably. Nonetheless, against the authority of the law, and just as important, is the freedom of speech. Here, I wish to be clear, 
I'm not suggesting that the judiciary, courts, and the work of the courts should in any way be immune from free speech. There's no reason why they should be in any way, and indeed free speech often benefits the administration of justice. A tension inevitably exists between these two facets I've just mentioned. The freedom of speech, though a fundamental right, is not unlimited. In Australia, the freedom of speech, or discussion it's sometimes called, is regarded as essential to sustain the system of government that is constitutionally mandated and is accordingly to be regarded as effectively entrenched uh, as a constitutional right. This is, I understand, the nationwide case. It is, however, not absolute, uh, as a case, uh, as the court recently said in, in Longy. In Hong Kong, it is stated to be a right enjoyed by the residents of Hong Kong. This is contained in the basic law, which is our constitutional document. Under thir Article 39 of the basic law, the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights are to be implemented, and the Covenant has legislative force in Hong Kong through an ordinance called the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. Australia is a, is a party to the ICCPR. Article 16 of the Bill of Rights guarantees the freedom of expression, but states, as does the Covenant, that the exercise of freedom, this freedom, carries with it special duties and responsibilities, so subject to the restrictions such as respecting the rights of others and reputations of others, protection of national security, of public order, public health, or morals. So hence, uh, hate speech, law of defamation provide clear uh, exceptions. I shall go into the limits of free speech regarding judges uh, and the courts when dealing with a form of contempt of court known as scandalizing the court. Of more interest, however, is looking more closely at the concerns or problems that may arise when the exercise of free speech results in a distortion of what the rule of law means in a society. It is this aspect that can give rise to real concern because of the rule of law itself involving the concept of the administration of justice is misunderstood, then the confidence of the community uh, in the institution of the law, represented by Themis uh, and the, the buildings, uh, the court buildings we have, all this will be damaged. However lauded a uh, court system is, and how, however well it works, the absence of confidence in the system seriously undermines the rule of law and this, in turn, undermines society itself. A wake-up call is, in these circumstances, necessary. Now, before I discuss this aspect further, I must first say something about the offence of contempt by scandalising the court. I do not intend what follows to be definitive or a complete analysis of this form of uh, contempt. Only a thesis will do the topic justice. I want, however, to say something about the offence in order to highlight the two facets of the freedom of speech and the administration of justice. This offence is a curious one because it is just so controversial owing to the collision it has with the freedom of speech. As I've said earlier, this right is a constitutionally protected one, but even where it is not constitutionally protected, it is fiercely guarded and rightly so. The controversy is further fueled by the fact that in some jurisdictions, this offence has been abolished. It was abolished in the United Kingdom in 2013. Many textbooks and commentators take as a starting point the definition of the offence contained in R against Gray, a decision of the English Court of Appeal. The offence was defined in the following way. Any act done or writing published calculated to bring a court or judge uh, of the court into contempt or to lower his authority. Now, notwithstanding the vagueness of this definition, prosecutions for this offence have largely involved scurrilous and abusive attacks on judges, but not always. Gray itself was an example of abusive remarks. In the course of reporting at a trial for obscene libel in Birmingham, a journalist, Gray, Mr. Gray, wrote and published in the Birmingham Daily Argus an article in which the trial judge, Mr. Justice Darling, was described as the impudent little man in horsehair, a microcosm of conceit and empty-headedness, 
and that the fact that he'd been left a lot of money by a wealthy relative spoiled a successful bus conductor. Despite apologizing uh, for what Mr. Gray recalcitrantly, I mean, recalcitrant because he was before the court on a contempt, uh, he accepted that words were intemperate, improper, ungentlemanly, and void of the respect due to his lordship's person and office. So uh, he was fined 100 pounds, another 25 pounds for costs, imprisoned in the Holloway prison until the sums were paid. This is 1900, so you can have an idea of what money was worth then. Another case involved Lord Mansfield. John Wilkes, an 18th century politician, founded the newspaper The North Britain. In the infamous Issue 45, an article criticized the royal speech of King George III endorsing the Treaty of Paris in 1763, putting an end to the Seven Years' War. Wilkes and other publishers were convicted of seditious libel before Lord Mansfield. At this point, a publisher named Armand, John Armand, Wilkes's friend, published two pamphlets criticizing Lord Mansfield for acting officiously and arbitrarily. Armand was prosecuted for contempt. In the judgment of Mr. Justice Wilmot, it was stated the offense of contempt is not for the sake of judges as private individuals, but because they are the channels by which the king's justice is conveyed to the people. Now this, this statement, this link to the administration of justice is an important one. The third case is from Canada. The most well-known case in that jurisdiction is probably the decision of the Court of Appeal in, in, of Ontario in R against Copito. Mr. Copito issued a statement to a newspaper in relation to a decision of the Toronto Small Claims Court in the following terms. This decision is a mockery of justice. It stinks to high hell. It says it's okay to break the law and you are immune so long as someone above you uh, uh, said do it. Mr. Dowson and I have lost faith in the judicial system to render justice. We're wondering what is the point of appealing and continuing the charade of the courts in this country, which are warped in favor of protecting the police. The courts and the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, are sticking so close together, you'd think they were put together by crazy glue. The prosecution for contempt did not succeed. It's an interesting case as both the majority and the dissenting views of the court are relevant. The majority was of the view that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was decisive and that the offence constituted an impermissible limitation on the freedom of expression. The minority defined the actus reus of the offence was to include a serious risk to the administration of, that the administration of justice would be interfered with and that this risk had to be serious, real or substantial. The mens rea was the intention to bring the administration of justice into disrepute. On the facts, the minority held that the actus raised the offence had not been made out. There was no substantial risk because no right-thinking member of society would take the words in the statement seriously. The relevance of referring to this case is not that the facts are particularly interesting, but that the reference in the minority's judgment to the importance of the administration of justice has a certain similarity to Armand's case and the reference there to the king's justice. Also significant was the emphasis by the majority on the human rights aspect. The emphasis on the administration of justice aspect is however most clearly demonstrated by the approach of the Australian courts regarding this offense. I've assumed that the starting point in this area is a case called Dumbabin, ex party Williams. There, disparaging remarks were made, they were held to be a clear contempt, uh, made against the High Court uh, in, in the Sun by its editor. Reference was made to conclusions reached by the High Court, and this part is quoted, with that keen microscopic vision for splits in hairs, which is the admiration of all laymen, and that the court should be given some real work to do, so that it would not have the time to argue for days on the exact length of the split in the hair and the precise difference between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Justice Rich, who gave the first judgment of the court, said this, any matter is a contempt which has a tendency to deflect the court from a strict and unhesitating application of the letter of the law or in questions of fact 
from determining them exclusively by reference to the evidence. But such interferences may also arise from publications which tend to detract from the authority and influence of judicial determinations, publication, uh, publications calculated to impair the confidence of the people in the court's judgments because the matter published aims at lowering the authority of the court as a whole or that of its judges and excites misgivings as to the integrity, propriety, impartiality brought to the exercise of the judicial officers. Just as Owen Dixon added, it is necessary for the purpose of maintaining public confidence in the administration of law that there should be some certain and immediate method of repressing imp imputations upon courts of justice, which, if continued, are likely to impair their authority. Note the reference to these judgments to the importance of public confidence in the legal system. In England, well before the passing of the Human Rights Act 1998 and the ab abolition of the offence in 2013, misgivings were already expressed by eminent judges and lawyers about the offence. In MacLeod against St. Albans, Lord Morris, in delivering the opinion of the Privy Council, said that committal for contempt is a weapon to be used sparingly and always with a reference to the interests of the administration of justice. On the same theme of the administration of justice, but emphasizing the freedom of speech aspect, again before the Privy Council, is the well-known case of Ambard and the Attorney General for Trinidad and Tobago. There, the editor of the Port of Spain Gazette was convicted of contempt of court, fined 25 pounds, ordered to pay costs on a solicitor known client basis, imprisoned for a month. The offending article which Ambard had edited was critical of the alleged disparity in sentencing by magistrates in Trinidad and Tobago for certain criminal offenses with criminal facts, uh, similar facts. The criticism was, however, neither abusive nor intemperate. I, said, uh, I set out a part of what was written. It is the inequality of the sentences as fitting the circumstances of the offenses that seems to often demand some comment. And if we here venture to draw attention to this, it is not by any means with the idea of confirming uh, pub, uh, popular opinion as to the inherent severity or leniency of individual judges or magistrates, but simply with a view to inviting consideration of a matter that must, and in fact does, cause adverse comment among the masses as to the evenness of the administration of justice in Trinidad. Now, your instincts about this being as far removed from being a contempt as can be were shared by Lord Atkin, who's, who I saw a picture of Lord Atkin outside this, these courts just now. In a much quoted passage, fueled no doubt by the facts of the case before the Privy Council, he said this, but whether the authority and position of the individual judge or the due administration of justice is concerned, no wrong is committed by any member of the public who exercises the ordinary right of criticizing, in good faith, in private or public, the public act done in the seat of justice. The path of criticism is a public way. The wrong-headed are permitted to err therein, provided that members of the public abstain from imputing improper motives to those taking part in the administration of justice and are genuinely exercising a right of criticism and not acting in malice or attempting to impair the administration of justice that they are immune. Justice is not a cloistered virtue. She must be allowed to suffer the scrutiny and respectful, even though outspoken comments of ordinary men. The freedom of speech aspect was reiterated by the English Court of Appeal in, in uh, uh, R against Commissioner of Police, ex party Blackburn. In this case, the well-known politician, Mr. Quinton Hogg, who went on to become Lord Hailsham of St. Marylebone, he wrote an article in Punch magazine to the effect that the enforcement by the police of the Gaming Acts was rendered virtually unworkable by the unrealistic, contradicting, and in the leading case, erroneous decision of the courts, including the Court of Appeal. In dismissing the application of Mr. Hogg be held in contempt, Lord Denning said, let me say at once, that we will never use this jurisdiction as a means to uphold our own dignity. They must rest on surer foundations, nor will we use it to suppress those who speak against us. 
We do not fear criticism, nor do we resent it, for there is something far more important at stake is no less than the freedom of speech itself. Lord Denning then referred to Mr. Hogg as being entitled to exercise his undoubted right. Lord Justice Salmon referred to the inalienable right of everyone to comment fairly upon any matter of public importance. This right is one of the pillars of individual liberty, freedom of speech, which our courts have unfailingly upheld. This offence no longer exists in England, as I mentioned, and the reason for that is free speech. The offence, however, remains here in Australia and in Hong Kong. In Australia, the justification for the offence, I would suggest, is the need to take into consideration not only the freedom of speech, but also the need to uphold the authority of the courts, an administration of justice issue. Uh, um, Chief Justice Gibbs said this, the good sense of the community will be a sufficient, sufficient safeguard against a scandalous disparagement of a judge. And often that's going to be true, but sometimes it will not. The, this was the very point made by Justice Rich and Justice Owen Dixon in the Dunbabin case, which I've quoted earlier. True it is that the human rights aspect is regarded as important in Australia as it should be. But I accept there comes a point when the administration of justice is so affected that something needs to be done. It is a matter of balancing the two important facets of free speech and the impairment of the authority of the courts. This point was made uh, in Gallagher, this is the case where I'm quoted from Chief Justice Gibbs, where it was said, the law endeavors to reconcile two principles each of which is of cardinal importance, but which, in some circumstances, appear to come in conflict. Then comes the critical passage. The authority of the law rests on public confidence, and it is important to the stability of society that the confidence of the public should not be shaken by baseless attacks on the integrity or impartiality of judges, uh, courts or justice. A judge's own. I'm aware, of course, of the case of Sevdet Basim, who had pleaded guilty in 2016 to having done preparatory acts in planning for a terrorist attack on Anzac Day in Melbourne. The controversy, relevant for present purposes, related to remarks made by three government ministers, as reported in the Australian, to the effect that the courts of Victoria were light on sentencing for terrorist, uh, terrorism offences. The controversy was that these ministers were made to answer to the Court of Appeal of Victoria on a possible charge of contempt. As I understand it, this involved both a contempt on the basis that an attempt was made to influence the court as well as a contempt by scandalizing the court. I do not want, I do not want to wade into this controversy too much. A lot has been spoken and written on it. I was referred to an article by Dyson Hayden, uh, which was published um, just a couple of months ago, uh, which is an interesting article, I'll say that. I will, however, say this. I have no doubt that one of the main considerations that will have weighed heavily on the court's mind was the balancing exercise I've referred to earlier. It is one of the most difficult balancing exercises the court will have to undertake, involving the need to take into account a fundamental right as against another equally important feature and also one in which the very institution affected by it acts as the judge. In Hong Kong, the offense of contempt by scandalizing the court remains in existence. There have been very few cases, and these have been confined to instances of abusive remarks. In the leading authority called Wong Yang Un, involves a finding of contempt, involved the finding of contempt by the court against the chief editor of a popular newspaper in which there were what were described as abusive, offensive, and scurrilous remarks, which also contained racist slurs. Now, the milder abusers, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat to you, because it included referring to judges and obscene articles tribunal members as dogs and bitches, scumbags, mangy yellow-skinned dogs, stupid men and women who suffer from congenital mental retardation. 
Now, these were the milder uh, abusers. The Court of Appeal had to consider how such criticisms were to be seen against the freedom of speech contained in the basic law. It was accepted by leading counsel for the editor, uh, they had asked Sidney Kentridge to represent the editor, um, accepted that the term public order in Article 16 of the Hong Kong Bill of Rights included the due administration of justice, as an exception I mentioned earlier. The judgment of Mr. Justice Mortimer contained uh, the clearest statement of the position in Hong Kong. I readily accept Mr. Kentridge's point. The administration of justice in Hong Kong is held in high repute both at home and abroad. There is every reason to think that it enjoys a general confidence and respect. Therefore, it has little to fear from bona fide, temperate, and rational criticism. Indeed, the appellate process itself involves this and yet tends to increase confidence in the system. Further, like many other public institutions, it stands to benefit from rather than be damaged by such criticism, especially if constructive. Nor do I think that isolated excesses of disappointed litigants or their lawyers, which are neither in the face of the court nor related to proceedings, either pending or in progress, ought necessarily to be condemned as scandalizing contempts. Leave to appeal and the court of to the Court of Final Appeal was refused. The appeal committee emphasized in refusing leave that the freedom of speech is not unrestricted and every community was entitled to protect itself from conduct aimed at undermining the due administration of justice. This was an important aspect of the preservation of the rule of law. The reference to the rule of law underlines the importance of the dilemmas that emerge when one is considering criticisms made of the court. It is the rule of law that is of paramount importance in this discussion. And this is the correct lens through which one ought to view the question of criticisms directed against the court. We have just seen the controversial nature of the offense of contempt by scandalizing the court. It is controversial because of its potential in undermining the fundamental right of the freedom of speech, and this creates the dilemmas I've earlier mentioned. The controversy in, in the nature of the offense is demonstrated by an understandably marked reluctance to institute contempt proceedings for this offense, save perhaps in the most egregious situations. A number of uh, jurisdictions have looked closely at this offense setting up law commissions, Canada and New Zealand, for example, and the United Kingdom, as I've mentioned, has abolished the offense. The, the fundamental problem in this area is recognizing those situations when the limits of the freedom of speech are exceeded and the administration of justice is compromised to the extent that something needs to be done. When these boundaries are reached, what is the most appropriate step to take? Contempt proceedings can be an option, but there is an understandable reluctance to do so, as I've just mentioned, and such proceedings only provide a limited solution. Apart from those matters gone into earlier, judges also regard themselves as sufficiently broad-shouldered and thick-skinned to withstand criticism. Justice Felix Frankfurter of the United States Supreme Court said in a case called Pennicap in Florida, weak characters ought not to be judges. He's also the, 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 the judge who described the offense of scandalizing, um, uh, contempt by scandalizing the court as English foolishness. Criticism of the court and of the legal system are often extremely constructive. These are welcome and where they're made uh, on an informed basis. One does not have any difficulties in accepting these and though any, such criticisms may be harsh at times, they are to be encouraged rather than discouraged. It is when criticisms are not informed meaning they ignore the fundamentals of a legal system that they can become a cause for concern. This, I emphasize, is not a freedom of speech issue. One is, of course, entitled to make uninformed comments, but the freedom to do so does not make it right to do so. Such uninformed comments may also be harmful when members of the community become confused by what they hear or read by way of criticism and as a consequence, lose confidence in the system. This is a far greater danger than the odd isolated abuse at judges. 
Now, I have no doubt that most right-thinking members of society will recognize pure abuse when they see it. A growing trend, however, in recent times has been the phenomenon of entirely associating the integrity of a legal system with the outcome, one way or another, of the cases determined by the courts. Some of the criticisms against the courts in recent times, as well as over the years, have originated from this false premise. The courts deal from time to time with very high profile and controversial cases, and these cases can be divisive. I will give some examples drawn from cases in Hong Kong, although I am sure you will find parallels in the Queensland courts. Such cases can arise in criminal proceedings. Earlier this year, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal heard the case of Secretary of Justice against Wong, Chi Fong, in which the court took the unusual step of dealing with sentencing issues. Usually, it's, it's the role of the Court of Appeal. In this particular appeal, three student leaders were convicted of unlawful assembly outside the Legislative Council in 2014, it's our legislature. This case was particularly controversial as it rose out of a highly political gathering that got out of control. Violence was involved. The student leaders, who were the appellants, were given community service orders by the trial magistrate, only to have these sentences on a review by the prosecution converted to immediate custodial ones and quite heavy ones. The decision of the Court of Final Appeal was to reinstate the original sentences of community service on the basis that while the Court of Appeal was right to issue new sentencing guidelines for the offence of unlawful assembly, the new guidelines should not be applied retrospectively. The result was that the three defendants, the students, were immediately released. There were criticisms of the decision of the Court of Final Appeal from all sides of the political spectrum. Many of these criticisms came from people who had not read the judgment of the court at all or had no intention of reading it or trying to understand the legal reasoning, but who had given their views on the integrity of the legal system based on the outcome alone. For those who opposed the students, the legal system had let society down by freeing them. Uh, for the supporters of the students, the system had let society down because the Court of Final Appeal had sanctioned the new guidelines on tougher sentencing for the offence of unlawful assembly. The students asserted that what they uh, did involved an act of civil disobedience. On the civil side, usually in application of judicial review, the courts have also had to deal with controversial matters. In a case called Vallejos, and the Commissioner of uh, Registration, the court grappled with the issue of whether foreign domestic workers in Hong Kong could, by reason of the fact that they had ordinarily resided in Hong Kong for a continuous period of seven years, become permanent residents, notwithstanding that under the relevant statute, such domestic workers were classified as not being ordinary residents. Uh, under the Constitution, if you've resided for seven years, you can become a, a permanent resident of Hong Kong. The court held against the domestic workers. Reaction was loud. It is interesting to contrast the reported reactions to the result at different stages. After the decision of the court of first instance, uh, which was in favor of uh, Ms. Vallejos, her lawyer proclaimed, it is a good win for the rule of law. After the result in the CFA, Court of Final Appeal, the same lawyers reported have said, the ruling is not a good reflection of the values we should be teaching youngsters and people in our society. In another case called GA against the Director of Immigration, the Court of Final Appeal this time had to determine whether the refusal by the Director of Immigration to allow mandated refugees and screened in torture claimants the right of work uh, denying that the right of work was constitutional. The constitutional challenge was unsuccessful and the director of immigration's position upheld. The lawyer acting for the unsuccessful appellant, the same lawyer I was talking about earlier, is reported or referred to the decision as an embarrassment for Hong Kong's legal system. Now, I've referred to the reactions in these high-profile controversial cases. There were so because they originated from political and social controversies, not to target 
much less criticise the people who made these comments. They were, after all, exercising their right of freedom of speech. But in order to make the point that the mere outcomes of cases are sometimes seen by people, even by lawyers, as the barometer by which the integrity of the legal system or the rule of law is to be measured. This is wrong and undesirable. I completely understand that one may be dissatisfied with the result or satisfied with it, but to link the mere outcome of a case to the integrity of a legal system is illogical, unprincipled, and unfair. This is the distortion in relation to the rule of law I referred to earlier. The reason why such thinking is wrong is because it leads to a distortion and complete misunderstanding of what truly represents the rule of law. The rule of law comprises essentially, first, the respect for the rights of individuals, fundamental rights we call them, and respect for the rights of others, and secondly, the presence of an independent judiciary to enforce these rights. It is in relation to this latter aspect where the administration of justice is relevant. These are the characteristics of the common law. Accordingly, when cases are handled by the courts, judges are looking at the enforcement of rights by applying the law. The duty and responsibility on judges is to apply the law and nothing else. The courts are not influenced by outside factors such as politics, and they're not biased in favor or against any one or group. Indeed, one really be reminded of this or reminded again that all are equal before the law. The rule of law and indeed the common law are about upholding the law and its spirit of equality. It is the opposite of determining cases according to biases, whether one's own group or any particular group. Occasionally, criticisms are made against judges along the lines that they are not elected. As a conceptual argument, it has merits on both sides, but very often it is deployed as a means of criticizing results in court proceedings that are not to the liking of persons or groups. This can occur particularly in controversial cases. In a case called W against the Registrar of Marriages, the Court of Final Appeal determined the constitutionality of a provision in the marriage ordinance which had the effect of excluding transsexual persons from the definition of woman for the purposes of being able to marry. The Court of Final Appeal decided, <clears throat> applying a remedial interpretation, that the term woman had to be read and given effect so as to include a transsexual. This was consistent with the essence of the constitutional right to marry. There were strong reactions to this result with polar opposite sides, each claiming a victory or disaster for the rule of law in Hong Kong. On a matter as delicate and controversial as transsexuals, one will inevitably provoke controversy, whichever way a decision is made. Some commentators questioned the right of unelected judges, as they saw it, to extend the law and said that such important matters of policy ought to be left to the legislature. This is the view of the minority judgment in the case. It's a 4 1 decision. As criticisms go, compared with those which amount to no more than personal abuse, this was perhaps not so outra uh, outrageous. However, while I accept that there may be cases in which the courts should not determine matters of policy and leave this to others, it is important to understand the judicial processes as well. Whether or not a case is a high profile one, or involves controversial topics, or is just a run of the mill one handled on a daily basis by the courts, the approach is exactly the same, and it is a principled one. The court will simply apply the law, and judges will do so adhering to their judicial oath. No regard will be paid as to whether the result will or will not be a popular one, not that this can be gauged in the first place, certainly not to whether it will accord with what the majority of the community wishes. Indeed, to have regard to such matters is really quite out of the question. In particular, in public law cases, the protection of core values or core rights and the need to adopt a principled approach represents what I hope is a commonly held view of the public interest as far as the courts are concerned. The letter of the law matters, but so does the spirit of the law. In the area of public law, fundamental rights are to be construed and applied generously. On occasion, 
The courts will be the last refuge open to a minority in society pitted against the excesses of the majority. This is inevitable given the proper and operation of the application of the law. In a case I mentioned earlier, W, we said this, reliance on the absence of a majority consensus as a reason for rejecting a minority's claim is inimical, inimical to the principle of fundamental rights. We quoted from the paper given by a former Chief Justice of Ireland, uh, Chief Justice Murray, who said, how can resort to the will of the majority dictate the decisions of a court whose role is to interpret universal and indivisible human rights, especially minority rights. Back to Lord Bansfield, who said famously, I will not do that which my conscience tells me is wrong upon this occasion, to gain the huzzas of thousands or the daily praise of all the papers which come from the press. I will not avoid doing what I think is right, though it should draw on me the whole artillery of libels, all that falsehood and malice can invent. For me, this is what's meant by a principled approach to the discharge of a judge's constitutional role, the adherence to the letter and spirit of the law and its proper application, protecting those who need protection. This is part of the judicial oath taken by judges in upholding the law. In Hong Kong, even the law passed by the legislature will be subject to compliance with the rights guaranteed constitutionally, and, and statutes will be struck down if they're unconstitutional. In the 13th AIJ oration in 2003, um, the centenary of the High Court, Lessons from History, Chief Justice Gleason said this, judicial review of legislative and executive action is part of the High Court's reason for being. It involves the court in the resolution of disputes that have political significance, sometimes major political significance. Decisions on matters of that kind naturally arouse partisan feeling. That feeling is sometimes directed against the court. Checks and balances are applauded universally in theory, but people with power do not always enjoy being checked or balanced. The enthusiasm of politicians for judicial review may depend on whether they are in government or opposition. The High Court never has been and never will be free of the certainty that some of its decisions will arouse popular resentment and even partisan fury. That is a clear lesson of its history. What I've just articulated may seem obvious to lawyers and judges, but it may not be to other members of the community. There are, of course, those who understand the system, but choose, for whatever reason, often political, when criticizing the courts, to lose sight of these fundamentals of the common law system. For the vast majority of other people within the community, it is important that they do understand the transparency of the law, uh, transparency of the way justice is administered is a major factor in enabling the public to see how courts and judges operate. Decisions of the courts affect people's lives and affect the community. It goes without saying that the administration of justice must accordingly be openly conducted so that all persons can clearly see the process under which their rights or liabilities are determined. Were it not so, there is a danger that when important decisions are made, and these range from monetary liabilities through loss of liberty to important decisions affecting the society, people will speculate as to the reasons how and why such decisions have been arrived at specifically whether any outside factors have influenced the court. The independence of the judiciary becomes then questioned, and this would really be damaging for any uh, legal system. This is the damage to the administration of justice that Justices Rich and Owen Dixon referred to in Dunbabin, and which the High Court of Australia referred to in Gallagher. One cannot throw off a yoke like that. Transparency ensures that this requirement and responsibility to act only in accordance with the law and legal principle can be plainly and obviously seen by all. In respect of transparency, there are two facets to consider. First, openness of court proceedings. There should be no mysteries as to what goes on in the courts. Apart from sensitive cases, the public must be able to see the judicial process in operation. I've already, refer I've already referred to the Brexit litigation 
After the decision of the English Divisional Court in Miller case, there were outrageous headlines in the newspapers. I've read these to you. Such reactions were to be contrasted with the substantially less emotional reactions after the matter had been determined by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. One of the reasons for this muted reaction, even though the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the Divisional Court uh, by a majority of eight to three, uh, was that most people began to realize that the courts were not in any sense dealing with or deciding political issues. They were merely applying the law. People were able to see this partly because there was much better and more informed coverage of the proceedings, for example, the proceedings, proceedings were televised, than had been the position during the divisional court hearing. The openness of the proceedings had helped the public understand that the courts were merely applying the law and nothing else. Secondly, the openness of proceedings in court thus enables what takes place in court to be revealed to all members of the public. This, however, is not enough because there must also be transparency in the precise way a court has decided on the outcome of a case. This is where the reasoned judgment comes into play. I believe that one of the characteristics, indeed strengths, of the common law system is the existence of the reasoned judgment. Lawyers and judges alike, not to mention law students, often complain about the length of judgments uh, of the court. Now, I was reminded here of what the Chief Justice said last year, uh, when she was in her somewhat Jane Austen way, said, I have always assumed it to be a universally held view that a judgment should be as succinctly stated as the matter allows. Now, notwithstanding that, judgments run into hundreds of pages, even more paragraphs, but whatever they la their length, they serve a vital function. Judgments of the court reveal in great detail every step of the reasoning that leads to the conclusion in any case. Everyone, and not only the parties to a case, can see precisely how a result has been reached by the court. This enables a losing party to know why he or she is lost, therefore able to consider whether or not to appeal. For the public, because as we know all judgments are made publicly available, it can clearly be seen that the courts and judges decide cases strictly in accordance with the law. One may wish to criticize the legal reasoning of the courts, but by making the by making public the reasons in a judgment, there can really be no criticism along the lines that the court has decided on the outcome of a case in reliance on non-legal matters. It is somewhat ironic that many misunderstandings of the law emanating from uninformed criticisms can quite easily be rebutted merely by understanding the legal system that we have together with the transparency of it all. Perhaps more can be done to explain just what the legal system is really about. This has over the years taxed me in my present position in Hong Kong, where there are almost daily references made to the rule of law and the work of the courts. You will no doubt have ideas of your own. The challenge then is to try to inform the community of these essentials of the rule of law and the common law. The responsibility falls on all of us. Only when the community understands all this can there truly be confidence in the system. And confidence in a legal system is key to its continuation. The common law is not about wigs and gowns or the colorful history that dates back to English medieval times. It is about those fundamental principles of the rule of law I've just tried to articulate. It is these fundamental features that ensure for the community a system of fairness and justice in the resolution of disputes and a system that allows people to predict with some degree of certainty as they conduct their daily affairs. As we look to the future, the message must be a clear and simple one. A system that is able to discharge the responsibilities and functions expected of a legal system, namely to ensure that there is justice and where the rule of law uh, thrives is a system that is worth preserving and fighting for. I thank the Supreme Court of Queensland again for the honour of delivering this oration. Thank you.
The Honourable Geoffrey Ma has been a friend of this court for a long time. He has demonstrated that tonight, just as he demonstrated it six years ago when he spoke in this courtroom at the seminar to mark the opening of this building. His reputation is such that we knew that tonight's oration would be well attended, at least by some of those on the bench who have difficulties in conceiving of any criticism being informed, and for those off the bench for whom too much criticism is barely enough. Tonight, all of us have heard a virtuoso examination of this very difficult issue. The importance of hearing a considered and insightful analysis of this topic from the leader of the judiciary of another jurisdiction cannot be gainsaid. It will, I know, serve as a springboard for further discussion and debate, and for that, Chief Justice, we will remain in your debt. As a very small down payment on that debt, uh, we have this token of our gratitude and another opportunity to thank the Chief Justice. Oh. That concludes the proceedings. Would you please join us for refreshments in the gallery? Thank you.